very good afternoon and uh, i welcome all those who have joined this uh, karam yogi this edition of karam yogi talks which we are having on the occasion of uh, i must say women's day or which we have extended it to become the women's week which many people in my team says that it's not a day or a week or time should be regarded as women this is the women's era so uh, on this occasion of uh, women's day week year or whichever time frame we may look at we welcome all of you to join on the very important topic of which is the theme of this year's uh, women's day celebrations digital innovation and technology for gender equality and it uh, it meets uh, the kind of objectives of karam yogi bharat that we are doing and karam yogi talks is as you know is a series of conversations that we have introduced wherein we get uh, policy makers we get technology leaders we get thought leaders we get practitioners who come and uh, give their insights on a very topical issue we have had uh, speakers like uh, mr r chandrashekhar professor michael kramer uh, mr r bala subramaniam mr uh, andre nogera professor patrick witney who has spoken on this uh, karam yogi talks platform and uh, have deliberated on several topics right from emerging technologies to the mission karam yogi to uh, design thinking so we have had several uh, renowned speakers coming to that and on this very important topic of innovation technology for gender equality we have two of the best practitioners whom we can think of from within the government and industry who are here to us today on to deliberate on this subject we have ms radha chauhan ma'am who is secretary of department of uh, personnel and training and she has been a leader all through she comes from the 1988 batch of the indian administrative service of the up cadre and she has excelled in almost every position she has held so far the gem platform is one of the things that every government servant across the country uses and ma'am was the architect for that apart from playing a critical role in building up the aadhar platform as also shaping up most of the digital india initiatives that we are so proud of today so it's uh, an honor or privilege uh, to have you ma'am uh, amongst us today to deliberate on this very important topic of how do we use technology and how do we use innovation for gender equality we also have uh, ms debajani ghosh who is the president of nascom and she has been like uh, one of the foremost champions of using technology building partnership between government and industry she has uh, comes with a long experience of having worked in the industry she was the first woman to lead intel india she was the first woman to lead the mate and she has been the first uh, uh, women president of nascom and apart from that she has always been supportive of all our initiatives and she has been i must say that she has transformed nascom to a place where uh, the entire it industry and the government here especially the digital india wing of the government is very proud of she is also a board member of uh, uh, karam yogi bharat and uh, we are proud to welcome both the board members of karam yogi bharat today uh, on this uh, interaction that we have so uh, we all know that uh, technology can play a great role for uh, gender equality and the digital like how do we ensure that digital technologies reach, reach each and every one so we will be benefited by the thoughts of uh, two of our panelists today so i'll start the conversation by by welcoming both of you ma'am and would request radha chauhan ma'am to give her opening uh, comments thank you abhishek thank you for having me on this very interesting and empowering panel and good to share the stage with devjani who has been a trail user as far as i have known this sector and uh, of course a very warm greetings to all the uh, participants to this webinar today it's indeed a great pleasure and it's interesting to see how this dialogue is taken forward but yeah the un coming out with digit all innovation and technology for treating for addressing the gender parity issue the gender divide issue i've been sort of uh, thinking about what is it that we mean when we talk about the gender divide Uh, when we talk of uh, technology initiatives innovations as i see it uh, a how the women herself how do they view themselves whether they think of themselves as empowered beings in the society and how do they interact with the technology that is provided to them in their hands as a tool so technology as a tool i'm sure is as all of us realize it's just like a pen in your hand you could write a poetry with it you 
could write a war novel with it. It's an agnostic tool in the hands of people who use it. But when you take the same tool, it's a powerful tool that technology brings to you and put it in the hands of, in the hands of women across different societies, different communities, the whole complexion of how the technology pans out entirely changes. It's like water, it takes shape in the way you put it in a vessel. So when you put it in the hands of a young girl in a rural school, how she uses, say, a smartphone in uh, using her social media app and how a girl, girl in the same standard in the uh, urban area uses it and how a woman in the household uses a technology platform and how probably an officer in the government uses it. All of this, I think, takes the complexion of how it is put to use from where the women come from. And I'm saying women because uh, it's historical, it's cultural, it's a legacy, almost congenitally, they haven't had a very equal uh, run in the society as an equal partner of the other species that is the, uh, the men in the society. So considering the uh, divide that is handed over to each of these communities and societies by way of a congenital legacy, I think that brings in an innate divide in the hands of girls and women, how the technology is put to use. I just wanted to uh, end my opening remarks. I was going through the UN document and very strangely, it used a term, ICT facilitated gender violence. ICT facilitating gender violence, I think that sort of says the concern that we all have when you have a virtual empowerment to a small girl in a school where she could post whatever she thought she could, whether it's a, it's a photo or a French photo or whatever. It's a virtual empowerment that has no limitations to it. But when the virtual empowerment meets the real time community and society interacting to her using the tool, I think that is where the great concerns of a divide, where the levels of maturity, evolution, the divide between the virtual reality, which is global, globally, globally empowering, and then suddenly you bring it to this hyper local evolution or society's level of seeing that empowerment. And I think that is where the gender sensitive initiatives, both by how do we enable technology to be used in the hands of the girls and women in our societies, as also the, the creation of the innovation by way of technology, how many women are there in creating these technologies because they're being a part of that ecosystem also brings in a sensitivity which may be lacking as of now where we do not have many of the women leadership in the technology led initiatives. I think that uh, I will end with that for to start with. I hope I made sense. Yes, yes, ma'am. That is a very interesting perspective, ma'am, with regard to how technology can be a tool for gender empowerment as also how do we ensure that women are there in leadership positions in technology? So that actually brings, uh, the, the, that sets the right context for bringing Devjani because she has been at the leadership positions and she has worked very closely in, um, very closely in trying to use technology for empowering businesses or empowering uh, uh, services in the company that she has worked on in the positions she has held with held, especially with startups and all. So I'd like to, uh, hear your perspective with regard to this very important perspective, like how technology can lead to gender equality and what it means for women technology leaders. 
Thank you very much, Abhishek. And I have to say, it is such a privilege to be on this panel with La Radha Ma'am, someone I have begun to admire so much. So really a pleasure to be here and especially on this very important topic. And you're right, Abhishek, it's no more Women's Day or Women's Week. It's the era of women. And, uh, and I'm so glad we are having this conversation not on Women's Day. But um, you know, coming from the tech industry, there's a big change that's happening. The conversations are no more about uh, why do we need more women? Nobody is questioning that anymore. Nobody, right? The conversations have shifted to why don't we have more women? And there's a big difference, right? Where are we going to find the women that we need? Why don't we have more women in, um, in leadership roles? Why don't we have more women uh, in key key uh, areas like product development, etc. So it's a very interesting conversation. And there is a this is happening. This change is happening because I think CEOs across the world have begun to realize that inclusion is not a good thing to do, but inclusion is a must do for business success. It's directly tied to how successful your business is. And there is data after data that shows that having a truly inclusive team, having a truly inclusive leadership team is what helps you in today's world. So I think we can park that question of uh, why do we need more women? I, I, you know, that train has left the station. And I think what we need to be talking about as an industry is how. How do we get more women into critical roles? How, at, at, as a tech industry, I'm very proud that we are already 50% plus at hiring. So at hiring, uh, we actually hire more women than men, right? Uh, but yes, we do lose women as we go up. So how do we ensure that does that those leaks are taken care of and we stop losing good women as we move up is what we are talking about today in the industry. And I'm very proud that all my friends, every CEO that I work with has made this a priority item for themselves, not just for the company, but even for themselves as a sponsor. So this is a good place for us as an industry to be in. And it's reflecting in numbers. Today, we are 36% women in the tech industry. And this number is continuously going up, up, up every single year. So it's a, it's a, it's a good progress that is being made. Now, talking about technology, I think, I think Radha Ma'am said it so well that technology is an agnostic tool. I, I call it, I, you know, I say the technology is a lifeless tool. It's, it's at least thankfully till now we haven't figured out um, how, to, how to get it to replace humans, right? So, so, so far we are good. Technology is a tool in our hands. And I think we humans have a choice to make. We have to choose whether we are going to use the technology and the powerful uh, you know, compute that is available to us today to create more divides, to create more disagreements, more conflicts, or are we going to turn it around and use the technology and the power that we have in our hand to create the most powerful tool for or an equalizer that human beings have ever created. And I think that choice is on us. Technology will, have, will do what we tell it to do, right? And I think this is where, frankly, you have to have inclusive voices making these choices. It cannot be one set of people deciding what is good for humanity. That just doesn't work anymore. And if you just take India, if I'm not wrong, women population is more than men in india so you you we we cannot have a sector decide what's good for everyone when women are around 52 percent of india's population if i'm not wrong uh, whatever number i had seen lately i think it's very important to have women in the right decision making tables to decide how technology should be used? How do we use it as a tool for, for bridging the gaps rather than creating the gaps? 
How do we use it as a tool that can help human beings address the inherent biases built into us? I hear so many people talk about bias-free technology. You cannot have bias-free technology because bias-free humans do not exist. We are we, you, me, everyone, we have biases built into us. It happens from childhood, right? But yes, technology can play the role of making us aware of these biases because a lot of them are, you know, by unconscious biases, biases that we are not aware of. And hopefully most of us, when we get aware of these biases, we act on it. So how do we get technology to help us address or, um, minimize the risk of human bias? How do we get technology to bridge gaps between language, to bridge gaps between culture? I think this is these are very, very interesting roles that technology can play. But once again, if we humans choose that this is how we want to use technology, and I want to keep reinforcing that because it is not up to the technology, it is up to us humans. And unfortunately, so far, we have not made very good use of technology, but you know, we hopefully we will get it right. The last thing I wanna say on this is when you're talking about women and inclusion, and let's take India. If we leave out women, whether it is from the workforce or whether it is from participation in techno how technology is getting used or created or developed or anything else, then it's like fighting a battle with more than 50% of your army not being utilized. And it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. So I think food for thought for everyone. And the, the question for, our, for us has to be, how do we achieve that state of inclusion, which will truly ensure that we are leveraging the best talent, irrespective of gender or anything else, to create that planet, planet that our kids absolutely deserve. Thank you, Devjani. That was very, very insightful with regard to how, how we can do and how what all we can do to make it into a more equal world in general. And uh, it's very rightfully say everywhere in every segment that we see, though we hear a lot of stories about women empowerment and women leading, uh, uh, occupying important positions in, in armed forces, in non-conventional uh, positions also, if we may use the word. In fact, there was a data point that women, uh, uh, India has one of the most highest number of women pilots uh, when it comes to commercial pilots. So there are women who are leading our entire space research. If when you look at like the mission director of uh, Mars research, Chandrayaan, all are women. We see women in uh, NIC, I've been seeing in government tech and in, even in private sector tech industry. We do see a lot of women tech uh, leaders. But when we come at the overall uh, ecosystem, we find that there are lots of instances of gender gap in opportunities that people can get. And even when we look at uh, the micro level, in fact, last year, we were having a similar interaction with Digital India beneficiaries. And we were told, especially during COVID times, that many families which had one smartphone, invariably the smartphone for online learning went to the boy child and the turn of the girl, ch girl ch children, they came after the boys. So this uh, digital gender gap is a reality, has been there uh, for quite some time. So we need to think of, so ma'am, I would like to come to you, Radha Chauhan ma'am, like, what are the measures that we in the government or we as a society can take to reduce the digital gender gap as it exists in the society today? I think Abhishek, um, I, I don't see much happening by just uh, legislating and probably coming out with some kind of a mandate. All of those are signals that the society is willing to move on in looking at the, like Devjani said, more than half the population as equal partners, if not better partners, at least equal partners in whatever we are charting ahead. So I, I think there are, there are certain biases which are inbuilt in our governance system. For instance, governance is where I see a lot of sensitivity is required in understanding very uh, subtle nuances. As leaders in governance, women who have already sort of jumped those challenges and are in positions where they can 
bring in that parity as administrators in districts, as policy makers within government. I, just to quote a small instance, as, as uh, two years into service in UP and uh, in the districts of Allahabad and Banaras, Varanasi, whenever you would go and you, you would sort of hold a village level meeting, and you would go to these uh, households and say, Ki aap meeting mein aaje ye. the Mahila, you knock the door and the Mahila would come out, the, the mistress of the house would come out and she would say, Ghar mein koi nahi hai. I found it very, very telling that she herself doesn't think that, you know, she, she has and she should be part of the dialogue that was happening about the community's development. And so that the first point that I made was, is inherently a woman being empowered to look at herself as an equal partner? Even today, when you so these are small nuances which you and I, as people working with communities at these local levels, young officers who do, they must be trained and sensitized to understand and pick up these disempowering uh, look that our women folk have. And this happens because for ages, rightly or wrongly, if we believe something is uh, okay with doing as a woman and some things are not, we don't question them. And you question them in certain, like it's not a monolith, uh, the society is. Some of us who have come here, we know how to articulate, how to look at things that are disempowering, protest against it, voice it out, articulate our own uh, impressions of if somebody is being biased. But when I myself don't think that it is a bias, then somebody, when I myself say I'm not, there's nobody at home, so I don't think anybody can, from my place can come and contribute. How do you empower that person first? I think it is that inherent empowerment of every component in each of those societies. That is where the governance systems, how your, uh, Tessildars, your revenue officials, how they treat you and I know when you go to the court, you hardly see a lady Peshkar, you hardly see any lady advocates in the local kacheri level. I, I'm sure people who have worked in the districts and Mufusil areas, they know when you have the whole courtrooms where most of the land uh, disputes are handled, if you see it is still no women kind of an ecosystem. Now the, the site itself signals to you a bias that has to be overturned, flipped. Now, how do you do it? You can't sort of legislate. There is no legislation that says that uh, women advocates cannot be part of it. But the point is, there are things that have to be done beyond the legislation and beyond the rules. And that is where I think these Women Day celebrations, the spirit, where you and I have this, and maybe people participating here go to their families, talk about it. There is a cascading effect of these kinds of gaps that we see, and also how people have addressed it. There have been there are marvelous examples, very effective way. A lot of young officers in the governance systems have dealt with such biases at a local level and very innovatively and creatively. Now add to this a technology tool in the hands of such women. So I think a sterling example is the self-help groups. Yeah. That absolutely marvelous transformation where most of them might be illiterate, but they can handle a smartphone, they can handle a bank account, they can transact, they can market their products. So you do have such transformative initiatives, which actually put out the enormous potential that you have when you empower the society to see women as entrepreneurs, see, see and accept women as equal partners in a lot of decision making. Mahila Pradhan's initially 20 years back, Mahila Pradhan's sign bhi nahi karte the. the She would say, my husband will come and sign. I don't know what it is, but I have to sign. But now you, I'm told the whole company, they insist, they run as any men or maybe better than male Pradhan's now. So I think it's a journey that is not going to happen overnight. But the more and more we sensitize 
local level leaderships, whether it's within government, beyond the governments, in the community, in the society, and more than the women getting empowered, I think the men have to be sensitized in not doing anything much, at least accepting if they move forward. Mere acceptance of somebody moving forward on their own course, it's itself supportive of a lot of, uh, I'm saying this because in a lot of SHG stories, the constant refrain is, Hamare pati se hai. They are, he's very happy that I'm going out. He's very happy that I'm earning. See, that's also a positive signal. It's not as though she has to look for that validation, but that validation helps. It's not a competition with them. It's like collaborating with your uh, the other gender. So I, I would look at it as governance, certainly as a catalyst, as a catalytic agent, but certainly the other players in the ecosystem would also have to pitch in to push these small nuanced bias against anti-bias stance that we should promote and encourage. Very rightly said, ma'am. If I may just add to yeah. that for a sec, you know, um, I think that empowerment, and this is something I've heard from my father all my life, which is empowerment comes with financial independence. Right. If you don't have that, you will never be empowered because if you're then you're dependent on someone for your day to day life living. Right. And I think if we can zero down and really focus on financial inclusion as a key initiative for rural women, which is what is happening, by the way, through all these rural entrepreneurship programs, et cetera, et cetera we can drive that cultural and mindset change. It'll take time. India is a tremendously large country. We have so much of diversity. It'll take time. But I strongly believe it can be done. And if you may, I'll just share a very small a story that is very close to my heart. So this was when I had just come back to India um, years, years, years back, 2012. And uh, we were I was with a tech company and we were grappling with this same thing, problem of empowering women, et cetera. And we started talking about financial independence. So we started doing these, uh, we used to work with the CSCs, Mr. Dinesh Tyagi and you know, his entire team. And we were working with the CSCs to run these micro entrepreneurship programs for women. And they were large turnouts. And then we realize it's not just the earning, right? Because when they earn, the, fa the husband is who's taking the money and deciding what to do with it. And around that time, some a little later, I think a few years later, the Jandhan Yojana started. So people were opening bank accounts. And I was in one of these sessions. I used to love going and going to the CSCs and sitting down and seeing how things are working out. And some of these women started telling me, we don't know whether the money is in the bank or whether it's being used by the husband for something else, you know. If we could just figure that out, we would, we would get so much power. And we realized all it takes is a few clicks. So we, we decided to build that into the program and we started training them on how to go and check online what was in the bank, you know, what. You won't believe it. In fact, the, the one of the CSCs, which was being run by a lady, one of the best CSCs, this was in Telangana. She called me to say, Devjani, you have to come and see this for yourself. And she didn't tell me anything else. So I went down and there was this narrow rail lane you have to walk through to reach the CSC. There were women queuing up. And I've never seen that in all my CSC visits. There were just lines of women queuing up. And finally, when I reached the CSC, I could see them going in, spending like five, 10 minutes and coming out. So I went in and saying, what is happening? And they're saying they do this every day. They come to check if the husband has touched the bank account or not. <laughs> and I was talking to the women and they said, this has changed our position in the family. From how our kids behave with us to how our partner behaves with us. This is changing our position because we are not just earning now, but we are in control of the finances. We know what's happening. And I thought there was such a powerful story in that little transformation that was taking place in, in the CSCs. Um, it, it, you know, these are the kind of things we have to think about. They're so simple. I think when we want to drive change, we can't force in technology to do things that is not part of our day-to-day -day lives. 
we have to understand day-to-day -day lives we have to understand culture and then see how technology can be used to help um, us leverage the culture values to the fullest to bridge those gaps um, so I just want to share this story because I think there's so much that is possible if we can just change and I say this as industry I think industry has to change how we think about technology, we have to think culture first, user first, and then technology rather than technology first and then trying to fit in usage models. Mm, Fred, can't agree more with both of you and especially with regard to like, uh, whenever we have seen, as ma'am mentioned also about empowering self-help groups or what we are seeing with Anganwadi workers, especially with the Potion Tracker project, wherein we have like almost 14 lakh Anganwadi workers who are like at the very basic level using very low cost phones in very remote locations, being able to do data entry on the Potion Tracker yes. for billions of uh, children and pregnant women. That shows that when given the opportunity, women do kind of come up and uh, uh, and are able to use technology as anyone else. And uh, Devjani's anecdote also reminded me, uh, took me back to 20 years back when I was in a district called Badayu in UP. And we were having a meeting of uh, women Pradhans. And I was trying to take a feedback with regard to, okay, like uh, we had 33% reservations in panchayats. So I was talking to a group of Gram Pradhans and I was trying to take feedback about how it has chain things and what it means to them and all. So this uh, newly elected Pradhan, she comes and tells me that we have been given only 33%, we deserve 70%. <laughs> So I was surprised. I said, like, uh, I would have thought it was logical to ask for 50%, but why are you asking for 70%? So she said that we also actually represent the children. So she said that we take care of children. So that should also be in our quota. So, so women, whenever they get an opportunity, they do are able to assert themselves and the same applies to technology. But that brings me to another very interesting aspect of technology that very often we see. We all are like enamored by artificial intelligence and what AI can do for transforming services. And the most recent AI tool that we all are playing with is uh, ChatGPT, as we all know. And the other day I was trying to play with it and I asked ChatGPT to write a poem on an engineer. And immediately it came up with that he builds uh, bridges, roads, everything. And it was all he, he, he. And then I asked, you write a poem on a teacher. So immediately started with she teaches, she gives us knowledge. So technology also sometimes have inbuilt gender biases which are primarily based on the biases that we have in the data that we have and all. So how, what all we can do, uh, both of you in whichever order, ma'am, you can take, like what all we can do to ensure that when we build AI models and when we use technology for building services, how can we get rid of such inherent biases that may come up? Devjani, you want to go? Sure. Uh, this is my pet peeve, right? This is my favorite topic, which is, any technology, not just AI, in today's world has to have inclusion, ethics, security built into its design principle. And if it doesn't have those, then we should absolutely not encourage the growth of that technology. And again, it's us humans, it's regulators, government, it's industry that has to take that decision and say that we are building these into the very design principle, you know, of, of innovation, right? And how we are going to innovate with technology. And this is where Abhishek, one of the things you lead, responsible AI, under your overall AI charter, I actually think that is the most important focus area for AI. Right. Because it's, it's not technology that will use he or she, it's us humans who will provide the data for technology to decide whether engineers he and humans uh, teachers are she. And how do we correct that? And I think responsible AI is really about figuring out through the process from development of algorithms to development of products and services to delivery to usage what are the guardrails and checks that need to be put in place so that when because again i said biases are inherent in humans you will never find a single human who's bias free so as we humans play out our biases how does the process put out those red flags saying are you sure about the gender you are using or should you be using a gender in, in this algorithm at all? Those are very easy to build in. 
they are very easy to build in through the entire development and delivery process of, of any uh, te technology. But I think we have to see the focus on responsible AI and the focus on large language models start at the same time both started the same time but one went crazy with investments and you know it just it just grew exponentially and the other one grew very very sequentially without investment without focus and i think with generative ai not just chat gpt but with generative ai we have realized that if we don't bridge that gap it can actually cause way more harm um, and it's not just harm to individuals, it can cause harm to businesses. We've all seen what happened in the last month or so, right? So I think this is where we actually in the industry, we are seeing a lot more serious consideration on um, why responsible AI cannot be an afterthought, but why it absolutely has to be built in. Um, I just think it is, it is so important for us to do it um, for business success, and for sustainability, because in today's world, trust is everything. Uh, your AI makes one mistake and you lose trust. You, you've lost your reputation. You've lost your business. Yeah, to add to what Devjani uh, says, I was actually looking at some of the figures today and it says uh, there's about 44% gender bias in the data that has been used for AI purposes. This is a human data. And they also say 22% lady leadership, women leadership is in the space of artificial intelligence. So I think the bias that is there, especially when you look at big data of the government, if you're going to use the data that government generates for feeding your machines and for coming up with your AI tools, then there is a huge amount of bias that the legacy data would bring in. And like uh, Devjani says, somebody would have to actually look at what it would, uh, it would actually, if not filtered, if not sensitively handled while we deal with the big data being put to use for delivering of very critical services, we would perpetuate it manifold and with most efficient in a most efficient manner because scaling up in technology world is much much higher so if you build in those divides which is part of our current big data if that is put to use without a responsible screening you would actually widen the divide so as government i think we have to be much more sensitive because we are handling the huge I think maximum amount of data is with us. And for so long that we have delivered these services, if you bring it into your delivery system using technology tools, the AI screening and scrutinizing of those data with a gender lens, I think it's an imperative requirement and it's no more an option. And I don't think we have that kind of skill sets available within the government. I don't even know whether the market outside has those kinds of people who are trained to look at the semantics which brings in the Indian languages that bring in a lot of uh, patrilineal way of using terms. They, those are the terms which need to be looked at with a different lens when you talk of a different world of AI decision making. I think that sense, that flagging and approaching it directly and the time is already there i think we if we don't catch the bus now we would certainly not be able to catch up the way we should be so yes it's a very relevant issue that we must address immediately oh, very right for you said ma'am having the right uh, responsible ai and ethical ai framework and building it in our systems and processes as we build these systems will be the key to doing that and uh, it will be a it will be a battle it will be a fight but uh, maybe that's the way we'll have to progress so this brings to me to devjani are there any like based on your experience in the private sector from nascom from industry are there any best practices regarding gender or use of technology from the industry that uh, that one can one could adopt possibly in the government 
I think one of the things we are doing as industry right now is, um, first of all, figuring out how do we measure how inclusive we are? Because if you can't measure it, it's never gonna happen. You can talk as much about it, but you have to actually start measuring it. You have to hold up the mirror and say, this is where you stand. So the industry actually got together, NASCOM pulled together the industry to start creating the first ever inclusion metrics, adoption metrics in India. And I don't know where it exists in the world, but at least in India, which we are now working with a group of 100 companies to pilot out. And then we'll roll it out to everyone, right? To use, to start using, because it's very important to measure. And no, it's not just about, have I hired enough women? But we need the more conversations to start moving towards how many women are staying, how many women are growing. Why are women leaving me when they have to get married or they have to have kids? Because women don't need to leave. But yes, those are vulnerable phases where women need a bit of handholding and a bit of breathing space and flexibility, right? But they don't have to leave. So why are women leaving me when they, when, they, when they have to go through those phases in their life? Is it because they feel that's the only choice available to them, right? And these are the questions that we are beginning to have, but we are basically saying every company must figure out how inclusive is it? And no, inclusion and diversity are different. Inclusion is not how many women do I have in my organization? right? It is everything else. Uh, it is the stickiness. It is the growth. Uh, it is the, the, uh, the fairness that you have in your system, right? And what we've realized is in this pilot that we are working, as you start having the conversation and shift the lens from diversity to inclusion, companies themselves start realizing that, oh my God, my job descriptions will not allow a woman to, or will, you know, will not be appealing enough to a woman because the way I have written out a job description, I have basically chronicled what all the past five managers have done and all of them are men. So this is not going to appeal to women. And this is why I'm not getting enough women who are interested in this position. So it's fantastic to see these kind of realizations coming in where they're saying, you know what, I just need to rewrite this. I need to rewrite my HR manual. You know, a big mistake that we, the tech industry was making is we were assuming remote work is good for women and where all the women will be happy because they can work from home. And guess what, what we realize? Women wanna come back to work much more than men because when they are at home, they're not just working from home, but they're working for home, right? And they're doing both. So women actually want to come back. So I think one thing we have realized is stop assuming what women want. Let's talk to them and figure out. Start questioning all your processes because for all you know, your processes are built on legacy and legacy is primarily shaped by men. So they may not be women friendly and you have to start measuring. And some of the things, Abhishek, which are easy to implement anywhere is for example, um, when women come back after maternity or after taking time off to look after ailing parents or whatever, right? Um, there is a tendency to say you've got left behind. That is not true. That is really not true, right? In today's world, you can learn from anywhere. So a lot of our companies are creating these support systems and forums where the, if you want to, you can continue learning. And once you're back, you, you not only come back at the same position, but if, if there's, an, there's a real uh, justification, you move ahead. And having that support to bring them back on board, providing that mentoring support is very, very, very critical. But most tech companies have returned to back program, work back programs, which are super important for, for women. And, uh, uh, the other thing we have started is just having these conversations more loudly and not in hushed voices and in closed doors where no one can hear us. But if, if you see something that is obviously a stereotype or is obviously a gender bias, figure out the right way to call it out. 
And this is where HR sensitization becomes tremendously important. But, um, and, and then last but not the least is safety at work. You know, that becomes very, very important. How safe and secure do you feel at work? Um, and and that, that is where a lot of sensitization also has to happen. But these are some of the things that are really working for our industry. And I hope it'll get us to a stage where uh, our industry becomes, my dream is we become the most inclusive industry um, in India and the world. Because I truly believe if we can do that, the business results are going to grow exponentially. Yeah, in fact, uh, what you mentioned uh, is so, so very relevant. Um, learn from every anywhere, work from anywhere, bring back women to work to workplaces, making workplaces safer. And many of these objectives are part of Mission Karam Yogi also, as we yes. see it. In fact, one of the most popular courses on uh, Mission on our Karam Yogi platform, apart from code of conduct is prevention of sexual harassment at workplaces. So that also shows that sometimes people don't want to even know what it is. And they, sometimes they don't even get an opportunity to do a, such a course. But when it's available on online platform, we do find takers for such courses, even on a voluntary basis. So that brings me to you, ma'am, uh, with your vast experience and especially with your efforts in driving Mission Karam Yogi, in what ways uh, you think Mission Karam Yogi can help address some of these issues with regard to gender divide and with regard to empowering women at workplaces? I think, Abhishek, it's an online system. So you're actually giving them an access to upskilling themselves, going for their trainings, because right now in the past, when we had them physically go for trainings, I don't think it was, it's mainly the gender that sort of came in the way, but also I think for uh, the women officers or the women officials, it was more of an issue when they had to leave home, go off on a training. So most of them avoided going for the training till it became an impact, sort of an impediment in their getting promoted. And then they would come for all kinds of exemptions that we can't go, our child is in class one or class 12, class 10. So I, I found it, I find it very vague that the childcare leave is now currently availed by the women. It's, it's mainly the women. But when I had a dialogue and I tried to find out if parents are equally responsible, why can't we have the men also going on? Male officers came and said, we are willing. But the, when I, the women said, like Devjani said, don't assume, the women said, no, this is one thing we get, don't give it to them. We want to take leave and we want to be at home and avail of this and take care of our children. So I think, uh, when you talk about uh, women's choices, there are certain counterintuitive assumptions that we make or should make. And the only way to sort of clear what is it that they feel is to have this constant dialogue with them. But coming back to an online platform for upskilling and training and capacitating and competency building, there is no doubt about it being equally a boom to all the officers all the officials of the government working in the government space to get themselves trained with the ease that any technology platform provides, which is I could go home and train myself, get tested as and when I can and when I have the time. So, so that you're taking away that one impediment which generally is cited, which is we can't let them go because there is work that suffers. So now you do the work also and then you get trained also. And if uh, we would like to think that the women benefit more, it, it's an indirect, a lot of assumptions we are making. And I'm willing to go to that extent to say, okay, women would benefit more with the online platform than men who can probably easily move to a physically distant place, uh, leaving their home and the hearth behind. While it's a little difficult for the women with the current, her own assumptions of, she needs to take care. I think it's more what she feels and somebody is telling her that you only have to take care. So that also is a gender parity issue where I think as a woman, I, I am going to do this role and nobody take it away from me. 
Right, ma'am. Uh, so that was that was a very interesting note with regard to how Karam Yogi Bharat and how the online access to courses can also lead to gender empowerment. Now, what we'll do is that we'll open up uh, for the participants to ask questions. We have a few questions in the chat, bo chat box, but uh, I would be happy to have the participants ask the question directly. So we have the first portion question from Preeti Mata. So Preeti ji, if you you can uh, unmute yourself and you can. Switch on your camera and put your question on. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for providing this opportunity. Uh, it's, it's great to hear the thoughts here today. And uh, I am uh, primarily from Oracle and I work in the industry and, you know, happen to work on some of the programs. And this uh, conversation was kind of bringing forward, you know, what we can do um, as an external support, what kind of ecosystem we can build. But my question was from the other perspective, you know, what can we do and how can we use technology to break the limiting beliefs that are so intrinsic and deep rooted? Uh, so what is it that uh, we can do using technology to, to you know, uh, counter some of those challenges? What are your thoughts? I can, I can go first. I, I think, I think Preeti, right? A brilliant question, by the way, first of all. Um, I think really, uh, before we talk technology, to, to change such deep-rooted beliefs, etc., cetera, um, we, we, we have to first go back to the basics and it's gonna take time and it's gonna take consistency uh, because it's not gonna happen with, with a, one messaging or whatever. And what's important is, how we message it, right? If someone comes and tells me, you need to stop doing this because this is what humanity needs, I don't know if I'm gonna stop doing it. But if someone comes and tells me, you need to stop doing this because by doing this, this is how you're hurting your own family or your loved ones or, um, you know, how, if, or a positive message that if you stop, this is how you're gonna benefit from it, where it's very obvious for me. I may at least think about it. I still don't know if I'll change or not, but I may at least think about it. And I think we have to think about the reasons. Why do we, we let's not assume that the stereotype biases are all bad, right? We've grown up with those, right? And there must be a lot of reason behind it, right? So it's important to understand why they exist because only then can you figure out how you can change it. And what technology allows in my mind is creativity to figure out how to build more compelling ways to drive that argument. It allows scale. So you don't do it one at a time, but you can you know, reach a lot of people and, 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 and do it. Um, and it also in some way brings to uh, the forefront the fact that the world is changing and it's a new world, it's a digital world. And you know, I keep telling people who tell me minds can't be changed. We change the minds of a billion Indians with respect to using um, you know, our phones to pay for everything. Can you even imagine that years back where we used to have walk around with cash and maybe credit cards, a few of us, but cash definitely. And we couldn't think of paying for anything without that. Today, you, you know how to spot the, the, the in, you know, folks who have returned to India for weddings or whatever, because they are the only ones who carry cash. All of us are using our phone to pay for everything, right? How did we get a billion Indians to take the COVID vaccine? How do we get billion Indians to start using the phone to order food? That didn't happen. Forget 100 years. That didn't happen maybe 10, 15 years back to share rides, right? So we have seen absolutely significant mindset and behavior change happening. And technology has played a key role. And in my mind, that's the learning we have to dip into and maybe work a little for harder to figure out how do we bring about these cultural mindset changes. True, true, thank you. I'd like to hear if Ms. Radha has something to add to it. Anything that you want to add, ma'am, just in case. You're talking to me. 
No, I, I think uh, I totally agree with uh, what Devjanit says. Uh, just by way of an illustration, just to make the point that you need to understand it's, it's not the scale. You can't sort of use technology as a size that fits all women. It's not a monolithic structure that you're talking about when you're talking about women. Women, girls, urban, rural, educated, and edu there are n number of kinds that you need to sort of who would use it differently. So the technology being agnostic to that extent, but when it's put to use, I think what as people who own that technology by way of say developing it or putting it out there is to understand what are the implications that it would have at least for the most vulnerable when they put, put it to use. I think that understanding needs to be part of our conceptualizing and designing itself. Otherwise, we would sort of maybe do a little more damage, which is not intended, but it's our understanding that provides us that uh, innate sense of work. And what are the things that they don't, that won't work? Because for instance, uh, this payment that's being made, initially when you had these bank satis, bank sakis, you had these guys going with the machines or rural mailhouse that they would give the money and they would transact. Then suddenly one whole village said, Hame laga ki humne paisa deposit kiya. we put our biometrics, but then now they say that banks are key sort of took it all out. We didn't know. So, they take, so, so you need to sort of understand the clientele which is going to use the technology. I think it's very easy, but at the same time, at least an appreciation of the different kinds of uses that technology can make available to different sets of users. The same thing can be used for good and the same thing can be used for perpetrating something that's evil. Because the power of the technology is uh, twin-edged. I think by what you're saying, what you're trying to ask, yes, technology is powerful and you and me sitting as even women entrepreneurs, women developers, women designers, we all can contribute more if we try to understand a little more of customization at the end of the road, the people that are going to you. At least the most vulnerable sections, we should keep them in mind while we develop and put it out. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, yes. Next we have, uh, you, important. Thank you, Preeti. Thank you. Uh, we have Swati Chauhan, who has a question. So Swati, could you ask your question? Yes. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, good evening, ma'am. My name is Swati Chauhan, and I'm from Madhya Pradesh, a think tank, AIGGPA, the body of Madhya So my question to both of you, ma'am, as you both are leading uh, in your industry or uh, get many positions or leading positions, I just wanted to know what changes brought in the working environment to break the gender process? Well, what is the? What are the changes you brought in the working environment to break the gender biasness? Okay, so let me take this because I'm, I feel very satisfied that I was part of the government e-marketplace. It's a right. public procurement portal. I, I think initially for the past, uh, DJ SND had 3,000 odd vendors selling to government for over, say, uh, 2 lakh crores that government spent on procuring goods and services. And you had 3,000 vendors. And I think maybe not even in double digit, you could have women entrepreneurs as part of that vendor system. When you sort of brought in a portal like government marketplace where you sort of opened it up for any entrepreneur, even a single lady uh, proprietorship would have come at that point in time, registered and sold directly to the government of India, the national government. And then of course the states came in. And I'm very fond of repeating this. Honorable uh, Prime Minister in his monkey bath in 2017, and Jim wasn't very well known. It had just been. But he said, I was very heartened to be told by my office that we ordered a thermos for the PMO 
which was sold by a lady entrepreneur sitting in a nut. Now that is a barrier that you broke so well and so visibly and tangibly. You had lady entrepreneurs and they were no less when they started performing. And today you have Delhi's, NDMC's, Solid Waste Management. Two young girls from Ranchi, they came and they said, we want to, I actually dissuaded them saying, this is not a place maybe, you know, the solid waste and NDNC and all, maybe a little messy, but she said, you said it's transparent. So if it is messy, clean it up. So we did, we did. So the, the absolute empowerment that you see today is more than 50% of the uh, products that are sold are by MSMEs and most of them are the women entrepreneurs. You have uh, initiatives on GEM, which solely uh, sort of empowers these women entrepreneurs, whether they are SHGs or rural households selling. They're all there selling to the national government. I, I think that's a great empowering commercial enterprise where you also give them the financial independence without any of the mess that comes with procurement because it's a transparent technology portal. Yeah. Those right. stories are simply amazing. Devjani, you want to add something here? They, they, I think they were just such great examples and stories. I think, I know we've talked about it. it from an industry perspective, three principles that I follow. Uh, one, first and foremost, is it a safe place? that women will feel that they want to spend time in. Um, is it a place where every individual, doesn't matter whether you're a, what gender you are or anything else, but is it a place where everyone feels they are being respected and they're being valued? Because that becomes tremendously important. And that's where a lot of sensitization and the whole focus on building a culture becomes very, very, very important where you just don't talk, but you actually make it count. Right. Um, and third thing, which I find very useful is when it comes to work, gender has no role in it. Gender absolutely has no role in it. When it comes to work, it's really on capabilities and talent. And if you can create an organization which values capabilities and talent more than anything else, in my personal experience of leading several uh, organizations and groups, um, women thrive. Women thrive. They absolutely thrive. In fact, they do way better. So my focus is more on cre creating, wherever I work, creating an organization that truly does not have filters, but that just focuses on you know, the capabilities above all. And I've seen wherever I've been able to do that, the women have been super successful. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think we need more women like you. Manjul Mayank Pandey. Puchi apna sawal. Sir, uh, particularly regarding the discrimination or uh, gender biasness, uh, my question is, uh, use of the technology empowered the uh, people. Uh, it is uh, for men and the women both. In such circumstances, uh, in, uh, particularly the rural backgrounds are different strata of the women, particularly rural, urban, educated, uh, uneducated, uh, and uh, economically poor, and the economically uh, rich people, uh, rich women. In such situation, uh, first question is uh, how the technology will be used uh, to all group, uh, means uh, heterogeneous group. This is the important points and uh, how can we achieve the uh, empowerment of the women basically equity equity ki baat kar rahe, yes. Ji. yes sir yeah like how do we ensure equ equitable access to people from uh, all strata of society when it comes to yes, use sir. Of technology for empowerment yeah yes sir particularly yes, sir. heterogeneous group of the yes, yes. Uh, women okay got it got it you banjulji yeah. So no better example than of that than what India has done with our digital public infrastructure, especially when you look at, let's take one example, UPI. All of us are using UPI. 
it doesn't mean whether where that matter whether we are uh, what gender we are which city we are in which village we are in what language we speak what culture we follow it doesn't matter it is a universal sort of means for all of us especially now with upi light etc coming in financial inclusion the way india has been able to achieve true financial inclusion because of technology because of the digital public infrastructure because of initiatives like upi because of initiatives like what aadhar has done to create jandhan yojana um, it is just mind blowing this is the biggest financial inclusion transformation you can see anywhere in the world and it does not differentiate based on socio economic background it does not based differentiate based on language it does not differentiate based on religion caste or anything else and i think there is no better example of true inclusion at scale than what we have seen whether it's with upi whether it's with coven etc and that to me is the ultimate use of technology for inclusion that frankly the whole world has to learn from india and i feel very very proud of that and i feel very strongly about that because we are the only country that has truly shown inclusion at scale um with absolutely no filters would you like to add anything to that ma'am okay so now thanks a lot it was a very engaging uh, discussion and i am sure there are many more questions but for want of time we have to move forward so on this occasion when we are having this uh, karam yogi talks on this uh, on the occasion of women's day or women's era or women's times on digital innovation technology for gender equality we are also we have on karam yogi bharat uh, platform on the i got karam yogi platform we have curated a collection of courses that would help uh, move forward on the gender education agenda on the gender parity agenda and these courses are meant for everyone it's not that these courses are meant only for women but it will give great more sen sensitivity and more it will make people more uh, aware of what all are available uh, what all is one should need to do in order to become more gender sensitive and ensure that we are we are able to build up a safer and a more gender equitable work workspaces for all of us in the government so i would request uh, uh, radha chauhan ma'am and devjani ghosh to jointly launch this uh, module you by pressing the button uh, which is there with you and the course will be launched yeah so can we have the launch of the course can you play the video please Oh. the shakti module is a collection of courses uh, which has launched on the igot platform so a set of courses will be available for all users this includes of course the one of the most popular courses of prevention of sexual harassment of women at workplaces it also has a course uh, for gender equality and development and overview it has a course on introduction to emerging technologies then it has a course on sukanya samriddhi khat in uh, yojana account which is available in both english and hindi then the entire microsoft package including excel uh, word powerpoint these courses are available so uh, and then there is a course on yoga for excellence so the set of seven courses is available and just like dakshta module has kind of transformed the way section officers are looking at courses these seven courses will earn a uh, kind of a certificate that they are certified on the shakti module on i got karam yogi so i would call upon all those who are registered on the i got karam yogi platform to undergo this course and get the yourself shakti certified on the karam yogi platform so thank you ma'am for launching this course uh, this module on i got karam yogi and we hope that most government servants will be making use of this so towards the end i would just like to conclude by requesting both our panelists to give their concluding remarks Uh, briefly thank you abhishek i enjoyed it thoroughly and i will say the same it was such an enjoyable and wonderful conversation and thank you abhishek for enabling it so thank you thank you on behalf of my entire karam yogi 
uh, Bharat team, the team which is working at the back end. And I must say that on the Women's Day, we had a small brief function in the Karamyogi office with my entire team. And I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see that our team is fairly balanced out of a team of around 29 uh, team members in Karamyogi Bharat. We have 14 women and uh, they are the ones who are driving a lot of uh, innovation, a lot of change. In fact, the team members behind the today's Karamyogi talks are also predominantly women and we will ensure that uh, Karamyogi Bharat remains uh, equitable and uh, remains a gender balanced team and ensures that the courses that are there uh, do go through a gender lens and ensure that none of the courses has any inherent biases which might perpetuate the gender uh, biases or the gender stereotypes which exist in our society. So thank you um, once again for joining this. It has been an absolutely pleasure uh, to have you both on this uh, Karamyogi Talks. And I'm sure many, many of our participants would have benefited from that. This talks will also be available on our YouTube channel of Karamyogi Bharat for people to view. And if you have any more questions there, please feel free to mention in the chat box there. We'll try to revert to you with our answers. Thank you once again for joining us this afternoon.